Good morning, everybody. Thank you, as always, for everybody being here. As usual, we give it just a moment for everybody to join. We have a really wonderful Grand Rounds presenter today, and we'll just briefly mention upcoming medical Grand Rounds. Uh, next week, we have Dr. Terry Hu for, uh, from the Division of Pulmonary Critical Medicine. We'll send more updates on uh, the title and topic of that, but this is one that's being hosted by our uh, pulmonary critical care colleagues, Drs. Rogers, uh, Mark, Dr. Nichols as well. So we're looking forward for um, our presenter next week. And then we have a lot of great ones coming up in the following weeks as well. And we'll send more information about that. But for today's Grand Round speaker, so again, it's really nice to go straight to our Grand Round speaker and not have too many updates for you this week. If you do have things you think we should update in medical Grand Rounds, please do send them over to me. I'd love to, to provide any updates that would be appropriate to have them, uh, at this time. But I'll turn it over to Dr. Elgin Lewis, who will be introducing our special speaker today. Thanks a lot, Dr. Lewis, for being with us. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we uh, really appreciate it, Dr. Ostaga. Uh, so good morning, everyone. And I have to say, it's truly a pleasure to, to introduce Dr. Hader Warek. And uh, he's someone that I've known, uh, and actually our paths crossed while I was, uh, while I was at Brigham. Uh, he's an outstanding person who actually uh, got his medical degree uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the Aga Khan University Medical College in Pakistan, and then uh, got a certificate in applied biost uh, uh, biostats from the Harvard Catalyst Postgraduate Program in Clinical and Translational Science. Um, after his training, he actually ended up uh, becoming a, a research officer uh, in, at his uh, medical college in Pakistan. And then he became a research fellow at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Uh, this was followed by being a, a research fellow um, in anesthesia at Harvard Medical School. And he did his residency at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, followed by a cardiology fellowship at Duke University. And he also um, was a research fellow working with, under uh, Adrian Hernandez um, in, uh, in, uh, for a year before finishing his uh, advanced uh, heart failure and transplant training at Duke University. Uh, Brigham and Harvard uh, was uh, quite uh, lucky in recruiting him. Um, and he started as a cardiologist uh, at, and uh, is now the, uh, the associate director of heart failure at the VA uh, Boston Healthcare System. Um, and he's a, a program lead there for advanced heart failure as well as a fellowship uh, coordinator for advanced heart failure and transplant at both the VA and uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital. He's an assistant professor in cardiovascular medicine um, and attends regularly at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital. And today um, he's going to talk to us about the Song of Scars, the untold story of pain. It is, I'm really looking forward to your talk. Uh, thank you so much, Eldrin, for the wonderful introduction. And this is just a this is just a special place uh, for so many ways. That you did forget to mention that when I'm at the Brigham, I round on the Lewis Heart Failure Service, which is obviously named uh, in your in your honor. We all miss you. Uh, but this is really such a great honor for me. Uh, you know, Stanford is a place where so much of the history of medicine has been written in my field of heart transplantation, for example, Dr. Shumway, Dr. Han come to mind, but this is also a place where the story of medicine has been told uh, and has been told so well. On the call is uh, Dr. Vergesi, who I'm, I admire so much, Paul Kaliniti was there. So for me, uh, as a physician, as a storyteller, uh, I can't think of a, big, of, of a greater honor than to be here to share about this new book that I've written called the Song of Our Scars, The Untold Story of Pain, and that really is my main disclosure as well. Um, before we get into it, uh, I think um, the, the question that might arise in someone's mind, especially after that introduction as well, why is a heart failure cardiologist talking about pain? Um, and I think that's a fair question. And the, the reason for that is because um, pain was a part of my life before cardiology was. Pain was a part of my life um, before I even finished medical school. And, and, and I'd had aches and pains like many people have, you know, on a you know, fairly uh, regular basis. But all of that changed one day. Uh, I, was, I remember I was in medical school back in Pakistan in Karachi. I was in the gym I was, uh, and I was lifting weights. And then I heard this sound of a click. Um, 
and suddenly my body stopped moving and I, the, the weights, I got pinned under the weights. I um, cried for help and my uh, colleagues and friends who were around, you know, they got me from under the weights. They put me in this rickety wheelchair and they rushed me to the emergency room, which was thankfully not that far. I was working, I was in the medical center. Um, and there I got an uh, injection of uh, Pitorolac and I was told that I'll get better tomorrow. And that's really what I believed. I believed like uh, that this is like uh, how I've been hurt in the past many different times that this is a pain that's going to get better and that time is going to be my bomb. Time is going to heal me as it has so many times in the past. And yet I woke up the next day and I was still in pain. My back hurt and uh, in, in a way that I'd never really experienced anything. And then the next day, and then those days turned to weeks and those weeks turned to months. And I really, uh, my whole life essentially changed. I, um, for, for a long time, I didn't think that I would ever be able to finish medical school. Um, I didn't think that I would ever be able to fulfill any of the dreams that I'd had for myself. Um, and uh, pain was not just a, an unwanted guest. It was, it, it had fully occupied my, my, my body to the point where I forgot what it was like to be pain free. Over time, my pain got better and I came to the US to train and landed right in the middle of the opioid epidemic um, at a, as a resident at a time when we weren't using that word. The word opioid epidemic hadn't been discovered and we had this crisis of chronic pain. And as time passed, I felt that there was a really important story to be told about uh, about this, that was not just about me. That was that was bigger than me. The story of pain, which is something that affects us so often, yet is so misunderstood. And at at that time, one of the things I tried to do was I tried to distract myself from uh, the pain. I took up uh, photography, uh, but somehow found pain <laughs> still all around me. Uh, so as I read some of the passages from the book. Um, I will be sharing some photographs I took from that time that reflect what, what it was like to be living in that space. Pain is a fundamental truth. Pain might well be the first sensation a baby feels as it's born, a gateway to the world of conscious experience, almost certainly becoming the sensation it most strongly associates with being alive. And indeed, every subsequent day of our lives, we experience pains of different types. These are often innocuous, but can at times become intractable. Pain is one of the most consistent aspects of the consensus reality we all experience, a hallmark of consciousness among all beings, hardwired into our frames through evolutionary mechanisms millions of years in the making. Yet pain is also the most fluid of all sensations, while how we see, hear, touch, and taste has likely remained unaffected by historical changes, how we perceive and tolerate pain has changed considerably just in the last century. Pain has transformed from a spiritual force, often the only language through which celestial agents could speak to mortal beings, to a corporeal corruption that can be entirely comprehended and conquered with biomedical advances. Yet other aspects of the place of pain in our society have remained unchanged. Pain in how it is recognized, treated, and inflicted has always been and remains an instrument of power, often used against the weak. For it is impossible to separate the assessment of pain from the assignment of supremacy. Pain is imperialistic. European colonists often derided the pain of their black and brown subjects, chalking it up to feebleness, even as they capitalized on its affliction. As Britain operated the greatest opioid production machine in the history of mankind, waging war simply to keep selling opium and addicting foreign populations to it, it banned the use of opiates for its own people, knowing just how addictive the poppy can be. Pain is racial. Black slaves are often subjected to indescribable violence under the false pretext that they were too numb to feel pain the way their white, white masters did. Even to this day, otherwise sophisticated people, including some physicians, hold on to antiquated fabrications, including that black people feel less pain because their skin is thicker than white people's. This is one reason why the pain of black people remains both underdiagnosed 
and undertreated. Pain is gendered. Women are more likely to feel pain, but their pain is also more likely to be dismissed. Many women who seek relief are belittled and delegitimized by some of the very doctors they turn to for support. And most of all, pain is personal. So personal that it is said to be the only thing truly our own. So inscrutable that it cannot even be communicated within the constraints of language. The only reason I mustered the gumption to write this book to attempt to uncover the nature of our most complicated sensation is that pain has been a part of my being for almost my entire adult life. In the last two centuries, our understanding of how our bodies flourish and falter has advanced tremendously. And yet, even as a song of our scars reaches a deafening pitch pain remains a sensation we comprehend the least. It is not an accident that we fail to understand the very basics of pain, especially its more entrenched manifestation, chronic pain. The attempt to define pain beginning in the 19th century using clinical and scientific terms shrank its scope to fit the constraints of the tools and rituals of medicine. The corporatization of healthcare transformed people into consumers, transmuting human suffering into a lucrative opportunity to maximize capital. As a, as a physician, I treat people who hurt every day. Yet my relationship with pain goes back to before I was the one people turned to for respite. Yet as we recognize the broad extent of this extraordinary tragedy, we have to consider something even more elemental something at the heart of what we need to accomplish if we are to beat back the current opioid epidemic and prevent an other from recurring in the future. Almost everything we know about pain and how we treat it is wrong. The expression people in pain dread most hearing is that their agony is all in their head. It is often used to diminish that agony to erase their very personhood. Yet our brain does have a central role in shaping how we hurt. The brain based on previous experiences and current expectations can modulate pain to be felt either more or less severely. The human brain is not just staffing the ticketing booth at the circus, it is a ringleader. Without the brain's permission, no tigers jump through burning hoops, no trapeze artists fly around, no swords are swallowed. To understand pain is to know the human body and the human mind and see how they are interweaved. It is the strongest repose to how clinical medicine still artificially divides them. To understand pain is to recognize how race, gender, ethnicity, and power come to indelibly mark what it means to inhabit the human frame. To understand pain is to learn how the greatest medical tragedy in history came to be how corporate greed and academic naivete and corruption fuel the opioid epidemic and how it could recur again. To understand pain is to explore the true nature of human suffering, how religion and spirituality have often been our most potent bonds, and how movements such as existentialism, feminism, and consumerism have changed not only our core beliefs, but also our senses. Broadening the lens through which I see pain has helped to defog the window through which I see the pain of others, an essential part of my work as a clinician. Even as physicians and nurses are almost constantly face to face with suffering, that existential leap known as empathy, the act of feeling another's pain is especially important as we increasingly rely on blood tests and imaging to tell us what ails a patient while pain continues to elude such quantification. If you twist your ankle or bump your head, or if you live with torment that never ebbs, what you feel and how you respond is not just the aggregate of nerve signals bombarding your brainstem. It is a sum product of your entire existence and the entire history of human beings encapsulated in the multidimensional experience we call pain. Reaching a new understanding of how we hurt will change how we live with our aching selves. Synthesizing our knowledge about the fundamentals of pain could move us closer to future in which even if we hurt, we don't suffer. And recognizing the many layers of pain and how we respond to the agony of others could lay the foundation for a just and equitable society.
So as we embark on this journey, the first thing that I wanted to do was really just to share some definitions. I mean, this is a medical grand rounds and I did feel like we should have some, uh, that there should be some parameters to what we talk about. And the first thing I wanna talk about is nociception. And nociception is really the unconscious neural process of encoding noxious stimuli. Pain, unlike light or sound, uh, pain does not exist in nature for our sensations to accept them immediately. They have to be processed uh, through noxious receptors. And, and this is the part of pain that is purely physical. It's purely based on whatever sort of input you get from the outside world, but it is unconscious. And what we've done and the mistake that we've made recently is we've conflated nociception, which is a purely physical construct, with pain, which is much, much more complex. And to illustrate that, let's look at how the pain itself is defined. Now, this definition of pain was put together by the IASP, uh, which is the International Association of the Study of Pain, and was initially done in the 1970s and was revised just with some minor revisions not too long ago. So basically, pain is defined an, as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. I would just break this down and you can get a sense for just how complex, what a complex phenomenon we're talking about. Pain is both portrayed as a sensation as, as an emotion. Pain is not, pain is also can be associated with or can resemble something associated with actual or potential tissue damage. The idea that you need to have physical tissue damage to feel pain is really a modern construct, but it's not something that is either supported uh, by the by the sort of centuries of history that we have with this experience, but also by some of the leading researchers and thinkers in this field. And yet we have conflated those two together because of, again, the constraints of our tools. And the last thing I wanted to talk about was suffering. And suffering is something that is very, very unique to us as human beings. Pain is something that can be felt by other animals. Nociception is something that can be felt even by plants, but suffering seems to be something that is our own. And Eric Cassell, who is a uh, physician who I had the pleasure of talking to just before he passed away in uh, last year, he came up with this definition that always goes back to, he said that suffering is a state of severe distress associated with events that threaten the intactness of the person. And it's not just physical distress, but even emotional distress or any type of trauma can in fact threaten your sense of who you are. But what we see in clinical medicine and what we see when we're rounding or when what we see in our uh, practice is something that is often and most often always a combination of all three of these. But you can certainly have one of these sensations or one of these phenomena without the other. You can have no susception without either pain or suffering. This is basically what happens when people are getting surgery under anesthesia. Uh, you can have pain without nociception, uh, such as what people who have phantom limb pain, for example, experience. They don't have pain for them is not coming from top uh, from bottom up. It's actually coming from top to bottom. And certainly we have this infinite capacity to suffer in the absence of any form of nociception or pain. And then you can have some forms of combinations, like you could have pain and nociception. And think about, I mean, we just had the Boston Marathon um, two days ago, and many of those athletes certainly had no susception. They probably felt aches and pains all over their body, but they weren't suffering. And the reason they weren't suffering was because they can stop running anytime. They know that their bodies are not under threat, and they know exactly why, why they hurt, which is a luxury that so many of our patients do not have. The next thing I wanted to share was part of uh, doing this book, I got to read a lot of science, a lot, a lot of really, really amazing neuroscience. And as much as, um, I've, as much as we have failed to understand pain, we're starting to lay the building box for understanding just how rich and complex this sensation is. And a lot of it is coming from the animal lab. And I wanna share some of the most notable experiments to my mind that help explain how we hurt as human beings. Now, this first experiment was performed in, um, by Canadian researchers in 1997. It was published in Science. It's one of the sort of landmark papers in this study. And basically, it was about this idea about the different aspects of pain. So let's say you have, you, 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 get, uh, you trap your hand in a door. 
you have nociceptive signals that go up your arm, up your spine, and then to the thalamus, which is sort of like this relay hub. But then there, it can take two distinct pathways. Uh, I mean, there can be overlap, but I think this is, it's fair to say that, they, they, that, they, that these two routes are distinct. One is uh, essentially, one route is essentially responsible for letting you know where you hurt, how much you hurt, and what is causing you the pain. This route, this, this pathway will go to your somatosensory cortex. But then there's a whole other aspect of pain, which is the emotional aspect of pain, the, the unpleasantness of pain, the hurt in pain, if you may. And that goes into essentially your limbic system and into the anterior cingulate cortex. And one of the things that these, that these uh, researchers did was that they actually used hypnosis. And I really hope David Spiegel, who is probably the world's expert in hypnosis, is on this call, uh, who's done so much to allow us to learn about this, but they use hypnosis to tell these sort of, uh, the subjects who had their hand in, in warm water um, that the unpleasantness of the water is increasing. They didn't tell them that the intensity of the heat is changing, but they just have them focus on it, the, in, the distress or the unpleasantness from the pain increasing. And that only caused a difference in just one aspect of, uh, in only the ACC, only in the anterior cingulate cortex and not in the somat somatocentricity context. And what that tells you is that pain even is, does have these distinct qualities. It is not just this one force that comes to our body, but it has these many layers, not just from a colloquial way, but really a, from a, on a neuro neuropsychological way as well. And that there is in fact a way to modulate and in fact break the relationship between those two. The next experiment was pretty complex, uh, I, uh, but it was actually one of the most remarkable experiments. And I'll simplify it. This was done right here at Stanford. And this, again, teases out more the emotional aspect of pain. And one of the, uh, uh, one of the most strongest emotions that's associated with pain is fear. And that, is that, that fear is really, really important because one of the primary lessons of pain is that it teaches you stuff. It teaches you what not to do most of the times so it teaches my daughter not to grab that hot skillet and not only does it uh and and one of the primary ways that it does that is by inducing fear how does it do that well uh researchers actually use like these small microscopes that are implanted inside mice to discover that there is an ensemble of neurons in the amygdala uh, which is where which is basically our sort of fear processing sensor that seem to only get activated uh, as the distress of pain increase, not the intensity, but just simply the distress and the, behave the distressful behaviors exhibited by the mice. The, this ensemble actually lit up even when we anticipated harm. So you don't really need to always be, have a nociceptive signal from below, just the, just the fear or anticipation of harm can actually light this up. And one of the things that they also saw was that even long after that, that, uh, that noxious stimulus had stopped, that ensemble stayed lit up for a week. And this is, in fact, one of the reasons how, one of the ways how acute pain turns into chronic pain, because people develop what's called central sensitization. Even non-noxious stimuli can now cause pain. And what they saw was that when they deactivated this ensemble, the mice withdrew similarly. So their reflexes were the same from the painful stimuli, but were, less, but were more likely to return sooner, showing that the lesson that pain was trying to teach them was perhaps not that learned. And one of the things that's really, really important is that the sensation or the phenomenon that pain seems to be, especially chronic pain, seems to be most closely related to in the brain is memory. And this is really seen very, very clear here in this experiment, also published in Science. This was a, this was a team from many different countries. Uh, so for long-term memories to be formed, what we need to do is have this process called long-term potentiation of synaptic connections. This happens in the hippocampus where our memories live uh, using a protein called PKM zeta. But keep PKM zeta does not only live in the hippocampus, the scientists saw. What they, what they showed was that when you injured a mouse, it increased PKM zeta in the areas directly receiving those nociceptive signals and actually led to the development of chronic neuropathic pain. And to really show the relationship between how important it is for memories between memory and chronic pain, when they gave an inhibitor of PKM zeta, the same mice no longer develop hypersensitivity. So really, uh, one of the things, so this really shows how closely linked memory and chronic pain can be. And one of the conditions that actually is very, very similar to chronic pain is in fact PTSD. Now, the main question I had when I was hurt uh, was how did my pain turn from acute to chronic pain? And I certainly had 
uh, my own theories. One of my, my origin story was this injury that I got in the gym and I had this terrible MRI. And I felt that maybe that MRI um, abnormality was associated with how bad I, I'd hurt, but turns out that that's not the case. MRI abnormalities are very, very common in folks who are basically walking around with no pain. And the, even the severity of the initial injury does not seem to be associated with who ends up developing chronic pain. And this was a really fascinating experiment. This was led by Vanya Karian. He's at Northwestern. He's a phenomenal researcher who basically showed that as acute pain in people with low back pain turns into chronic back pain, the parts of the brain that are, that are related to basically propagating that pain change from basically the parts that are related more with nociception to basically those that are more related to emotions. Again, blurring the line between what the real nature of pain, especially chronic pain is, and that over time, more and more, it becomes more like a trauma, more like, um, more like an emotion rather than a nociceptive signal, perhaps suggesting why so many therapies for chronic pain that focus in, in only on nociception fail. Now, before we go deeper, um, I think one of the things that I've learned through my own experience, but also talking to many others, is that chronic pain is just different from other illnesses. It, it, it doesn't comply to the rules of medicine that we have created or the rules of illness that we have created. It, can, it, it causes this relentless erasure of the human being that it reflects. So I'm just going to read a few passages here sharing some of those observations uh, before we go further. Disease is a primal part of every human being's story, a rite of passage we all have to undergo as we slowly move between birth and death. And the way we often make sense of our diseases is through storytelling. Patients tell a tale and it is the job of the nurses, physicians, social workers, receptionists, transporters, case managers, myriad others who together form this faceless amoeboid mass that we call the healthcare system to listen. Of course, the interplay between patients and the healthcare system they're enmeshed in is not one-sided. Medical professionals help assemble the narrative, trained over years with simulated actors or through MCQs predicated on whodunit style clinical scenarios, clinicians come to expect a certain cadence to patients' presentations. You don't even have to be sick or caring for someone sick to recognize that classic arc of illness. The vibrant person who precedes the patient is struck by mysterious illness, often but not always manifesting as physical discomfort. The now patient, often positioned as a fighter, charges forth in lockstep with their medical team in search of not just the cure, but even more importantly, the reason they were dropped into this minefield to begin with. The spirited and pugnacious quest for diagnosis is the plot of most medical narratives. Despite its amorality, the illness is not the villain. For when identified, even if not conquered, illness provides meaning and resonance to the person's biography. Building a new identity far more formidable than that of the naive, vibrant person of yesteryear. Chronic pain, however, does not conform to these rules and stereotypes. Chronic pain affects people in ways that almost no other ailment does. And while it affects people in myriad ways, its most deadly feature is that it disrupts the way a person moves through time, the narrative that they define themselves by, the arc of their stories. A healthy body feels absent and invisible. As we go about our lives, we focus on the world around us rather than the one within, which seems to work autonomously. Often when we attend to our bodies, it is during times when we feel pain or distress because the body is naturally absent when functionally well. By forcing it upon our attention during times of dysfunction, it disappears to us. That the body becomes so present during sickness creates a wedge between it and its occupant. People in pain feel like their own body is an adversary. Their bodies alienate them from their healthy, absent bodied pasts, and when it comes to chronic pain, they rob them of their futures as well. People with acute pain can see the horizon of health and normality that they will be able to return to, said Drew Leader, an anthropologist with idiopathic neuropathy. The pain of childbirth or the pain of appendicitis, one has this feeling that this will be over. Chronic pain has this existential dimension. What if this never goes away? What if it tarnishes and blackens every month or every year? 
With a past that has become unfamiliar and a future shrouded in dread, people with chronic pain become trapped in a never-ending present. Reader's research led him to a group of people whose experiences mirrored those of patients with persistent pain, people in prison. It wasn't until I spoke to the leader that I realized how much my own experience of chronic pain mirrored incarceration. I never really knew what my back did for me until I broke it. Turns out it did everything. It helped me sit, stand, and lie down. It helped me walk and run. After I heard it, an MRI revealed that long before my injury, my spine had been deformed by years of poor posture and poorly performed exercise which has straightened it like a poker out of its natural S-shaped curvature. My entire body had become tense, a rubber band stretched to its wavering limit. My expansive life was now reduced to my dorm room, barely bigger than a bathroom. Sitting in a car could be agonizing. A staircase loomed like an impassable wall. It hurt so much to the walk to the bathroom that I often peed in the sink in the room. At my worst, I couldn't even get out of bed, even though it hurt so much just to lie there. My physical shackles also locked me out of my social life. If friends weren't kind enough to come to my room and take pity on my pathetic existence, I would never be able to see them. Even as small as my room was, I couldn't attend to it since my back commanded all my attention all the time. It not only trapped me in a claustrophobic physical space, but also jailed me in the one point in time I wanted nothing to do with, the now. Pain prolonged every second I lived, making every micro decision arduous, making every day feel like an eternity. As much as I wanted an escape from my agony, I remained locked in place as the pain sapped every joy I could ever experience. Everything about my past life seemed so far removed. I felt another person had been living it. The things that gave me joy, the basketball court, the gym, the track, not only bread, resentment. I couldn't write because my imagination couldn't not regard the pain. It was so ceaseless that I remembered being pain-free about as well as I could remember floating in my mother's womb. When I looked at my future, I saw myself wading up an endless river of white water woe, thrashing me mercilessly. All I had was where I didn't want to be. I was locked up in the moment, in the penitentiary of the present. As my pain did get better and it took an army of physical therapists and physicians and family and friends, I moved to the United States and found myself in the middle of an opioid epidemic, something that I'd never experienced in my entire life. And so let's talk about how that came to be. And I think I'll, the origin story of the opioid epidemic is well known to most people by now. In the 1990s, chronic pain was rampant. Opioids, which had previously been taboo, were now being suddenly over aggressively prescribed. There was an article in the New, New England Journal which said that there was a new opioid had been developed, which was not a hypnotic and created carried no danger of acquiring the habit. And But this movement unfortunately addicted millions of Americans to opioids. Um, but the only thing here is that I'm actually not talking about the 1990s. I'm actually talking about the 1890s, because as much as we've been led to believe that this current opioid epidemic is very novel, chronic pain is something that has been cyclically following uh, our society. And before the current peak of pain that we see now, there was an earlier peak in the mid 19th century. And part of the fuel was something that is tied to the history of medicine. German pharmacist Sir Turner discovered morphine. This was followed by another discovery, the hypodermic needle. And then the trigger for this epidemic was the American Civil War, one of the most brutal wars ever fought in the history of mankind. And while many, while morphine provided relief to many, many, many soldiers who had, who had terrible amputations and injuries, it did leave a long tail of addiction behind it. But then a new pharmaceutical company discovered, developed a new drug that was actually touted as a treatment for morphine addiction. And that drug was heroin, which was touted in the New England Journal as being not a hypnotic and not being addictive. But the, but the reaction to this was the utter criminalization of opioids and essentially the entire cessation of opioid use, not just for people with chronic pain, but even with people with end of life distress. 
even people dying of cancer who have not given opioids as a reaction to this epidemic. So just to recap, in the 19th century, the trigger was a civil war. The innovation was morphine and the hypodermic needle. It resulted in one in 200 Americans getting addicted. The supposed solution was heroin. The response was essentially criminalization of opioids. In the 1990s, the trigger was that a lot of people who were at the end of life were having distress and dying in extremis. And also there's this burgeoning epidemic of people in chronic pain. Prescription opioids were supposedly the solution, but now we live in at a time when more than we've had almost a million fatal overdoses. Oxycontin was the supposed solution, but not really so. And our response so far has been deep prescription and some criminal and civil action against manufacturers. But have we done enough to make sure that this doesn't happen again? But before we do that and think about what led us here, let's think about where we are today. So these are national opioid prescription rates in the United States. These are data from the CDC. And my residency started in 2011, really at the peak of the of the of US prescriptions. Americans constitute 5% of the world's population but consume 30% of the of our of opioids. American dentists are 37 times more likely to prescribe opioids than British dentists. Having said that, those rates have started to go down, but they still remain quite high compared to other countries. The cost of this uh, epidemic has been widespread. If you just look at oh, fatal overdoses alone, there have almost been 500,000 deaths just between 1999 and 2019. And in fact, the pandemic has seen a huge spike in the number of people dying of opioid overdoses. But much of this spike is not because of the usual suspects or the traditional suspects, which are things like oxycodone and hydrocodone. There has been an increase in heroin, but most of this recent increase has been because of a spike in fentanyl. In fact, there has been so much, the effect of this has been so much that even as a heart transplant physician, I have seen how dramatic um, this has been. And many of, many of the contours of the epidemic have changed as well. It used to be thought that the opioid epidemic was only something that affected white people. But what we've seen, especially more recently, is that rates of overdoses amongst black Americans have also increased. And in fact, during the pandemic, they exceeded those of white Americans. As a heart transplant physician, people who die of drug overdoses actually now are the most common reason why hearts get donated. So it is the ripple effects of this, of this epidemic affect every aspect of medicine. And I wanted to share some cool unpublished data as well. One of the things that's been touted in the past is that is there a political determinant of this uh, epidemic? And what we found is that in 2001, in counties that were Democratic versus Republican, people who were living in Republican counties had a higher rate of opioid overdoses. And while the rates have increased in both, the difference has actually not remained the same. So this is not just a crisis in counties that are mostly rural or mostly Republican. This is a, this is a crisis of America. And to get to this opioid epidemic, one of the things that, that, that was done uh, often at the behest of uh, corrupt actors was that we were fed a lot of lies. Lies that we were told, that I was told while I was sitting in noon conference or in grand rounds or meetings like this. And I think it's time to think about how we allowed that to happen. The first lie was that opioids cause addiction in only 1% of pain patients. All of this came, that came from this one research letter in the New England Journal, five sentences long, um, which really had no means of even being able to address this. And while these authors have since been very, um, have had a lot of regret about publishing this. This paper has been cited hundreds of times, almost exclusively in an affirmational way, not just in research papers, but this is just the tip of the iceberg, but in marketing materials, etc. Even though now the journal, if you go in this paper, that does have an editor's note, um, my worry is that is it is it too little, too late? The other lie that we have been fed was that. Uh, was this about pseudo addiction, which means that if a patient was exhibiting any signs of addiction, it was actually the treatment for that was actually providing more uh, uh, opioids. This uh, sort of mistruth actually started from this single case report that was published in 1989. And the interesting thing about this is that the second author on this, David Haddox, became the CEO of Purdue Pharma later on. This concept too was propagated in the medical literature hundreds of times, 
And it was agreed on as fact 98% of the times, only 2% of papers disagreed with it. And the sad thing is not single paper actually tried to validate this concept at all. The third one was that long acting opioids are in fact safer and more effective for chronic pain. And this came actually from the FDA label itself. Uh, the label on OxyContin stated quite clearly that delayed absorption as provided by OxyContin tablets is believed to reduce the abuse liability of a drug. This was based on no evidence. Purdue had never tested this concept. And in fact, in court documents, they actually said that this was added by the FDA on their own initiative. Who could that have been? Some people suspect that it could be Curtis Wright, who was a lead reviewer on the FDA. This is actually not Curtis Wright. This is the actor who plays Curtis Wright on the new Hulu show, Dope Sick. Um, but, but he was the lead FDA reviewer for OxyContin. And two years after this review, he was actually a senior executive on Purdue, uh, Purdue's board. The fourth was just a very basic, the origin story of opioids, that opioids are actually effective for chronic pain. But the fact is, that this is something that we still don't know. And in fact, if you look at the best randomized control trial data, and this is from the, spa the SPACE trial that was published in JAMA in 2018, these are patients with moderate to severe joint or back pain who were prescribed opioids versus non-opioid painkillers like ibuprofen or NSAIDs. It found that over, over 12 months, pain intensity, uh, pain-related function was no different between patients who got opioids and non-opioids. But interestingly, pain intensity was higher in folks who got opioids. Again, suggesting in, that, that the tolerance that people develop from opioids is just so remarkable that people who were given opioids actually had more pain at, at 12 months than those who were given non-opioids. And again, going to show how something that works so well for acute pain might not be the answer for chronic pain. And this last myth, which is extremely pernicious and disturbing, is this idea that Black people have a higher threshold for pain. And a part of this is actually a relic of slavery. This is Samuel Cartwright, a despicable human being who's actually a professor and in New Orleans. He came up with this condition called dysesthesia ethiopic, ethiopica, which apparently to him resulted in a partial insensibility of the skin, resulting in a black person resembling an automaton or senseless machine. He claimed that this was particularly common among free black people who did not have some white person to direct and to take care of them. And because of this condition caused enslaved people to be insensitive, insensible to pain and subjected to punishment. Now, someone might say that, well, this was a few hundred years ago. What does this have to do with today? But a recent survey and that was published uh, uh, from the University of Virginia showed that a pretty sizable number of not only an online sample, but medical students and residents believed that, that black people's skin was thicker than white people's. And that because of this, they were less likely to prescribe than opioids. These myths are not just something that exists in history books. They actually affect people on a day-to-day -to -day basis. Many people in this country still are um, suspicious or have questions about whether racism exists. And to them, oftentimes, I will just share this one piece of data. In a paper that, that looked at a million children with appendicitis, uh, they found that the odds of a black child receiving opioids for CT scan confirmed acute appendicitis was only 20% that of a white child, even after adjustment for other factors. So these myths, all of these myths continue to this day. And I hope that this will be a vehicle to start to undo some of the damage we have done in medical education. And before I end, you know, I wanted to think uh, ahead and, and think about what the future of the body and pain might be. And to me, one of the things that I've, 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 I've learned through this process is that I don't think that there's going to be a magic bullet for pain. I don't think we're going to come up with this one magic drug that's going to eliminate human suffering, primarily because pain is not a disease like heart disease or cancer or Alzheimer's, it is a physiologic function that we need to survive. And so I think that that's gonna to be tough. But having said that, I do think that we have, all of us who are listening here, have this really, really special tool that if all of us use to the best of our abilities, we can start to reverse some of the damage that's been done. And to get to that, let's start in a different place. Let's start with, uh, with the placebo response. So the placebo response, 
is basically, and this is a this is again another meta analysis of patients who have chronic pain from osteoarthritis. The blue aspect is basically the response you're getting from the placebo uh, placebo effect of the drug, and the yellow is really the specific effect. And what you what you essentially see that a big chunk of the response that pe people are getting from the, the therapies that we're providing is in fact because of the placebo effect. And again, it goes to show just how rich our innate ability to overcome aches and pains is because we have this rich system of endogenous opioids that respond to anticipation, that respond to hope, that respond to the sense that we could get better if we just take this pill. Now, having said that, the placebo response is actually changing in the United States. This was another really cool meta-analysis of about 70 odd papers, uh, trials in neuropathic pain. And what you see in figure A is that baseline pain amongst enrollees has remained the same. But the placebo response has actually improved. So negative is better, which means that over time, the response that people get from taking a pill, any pill, has actually increased over time. And that's actually made drug development harder because drugs have just not kept up. But the interesting fact here is that that trend is being driven almost exclusively by trials performed in the United States, which means that Americans, when they get a pill, any pill, their faith in that pill is just so much stronger and it's only getting stronger with time that it will help them. Now, someone might say, well, the you know, placebos are safe. They seem to be incredibly effective. Why don't we give placebos to patients? And the answer to that would be that there would be a great, that would be a deception, that that would fracture the patient-physician relationship. And I think that that criticism is entirely valid. So scientists, uh, researchers did, went another step. They said, well, what if we do these trials and tell our patients that we are giving them placebo? What if we put labels on the pills that, that say placebo in big bold letters? What's gonna happen then? And this has also been tested actually quite significantly in trials of what's called open label placebo, mostly for patients with chronic pain. What, what they've found is that even when a patient is told that they are getting a placebo, they still will get benefit from it. And now the question is, how can that possibly be? And to sort of tease that out, um, I, there's this ingenious randomized trial done by uh, Ted Kapchuk, who is a placebo researcher here in Boston, I think starts to give us a sense for what is really going on here. So this was a trial of patients with irritable bowel syndrome. There were about 262 patients. There was one arm that was a waiting list. So patients were enrolled in the trial, but nothing was done. And this was really essentially to see two things. One was to observe the Hawthorne effect and B was to see what the natural history of the symptoms are. Maybe they'll just get better on their own. The next was what's called a limited placebo. And in this time, uh, basically they were given uh, acupuncture and acupuncture at the, uh, uh, and, and, but there was another arm. And this was what's called augmented acupuncture. So, so, this was, so in, in this case, people weren't just sticking needles into people's bodies. Now they were actually talking to them, asking them about how their symptoms, showing gestures that, that showed that the patients who, were ha who had these symptoms were feel, felt and heard and seen, and were, and were going above and beyond just performing the procedure to actually connecting with these patients, showing empathy. And what they found was that patients who got this augmented placebo, if you may, had a much, much greater response than people who got the regular acupuncture or the patients who were on the waiting list. And to me, what this means is that this is really the power of what we in medicine can do. It is this human connection, this love that we can share with people and this care that we can share with, share with people armed with our knowledge that can provide so much reassurance, so much comfort, even to people in acute or chronic distress. And it gives me hope that that is something that all of us carry. And if we use it effectively, we can help anyone who comes seeking our care. And not only has this, uh, this uh, augmentation been shown in acupuncture, but in other trials, even for physical therapists, they've done trials in, in, in which physical therapists were trained in something called acceptance therapy. And, and, and I'm gonna talk about that and showed that even though it didn't reduce people's pain intensity, it allowed people to live better and do better and actually required fewer medical interventions over time. And so one of the things that I, in all my reading, am, am very um, uh, optimistic about and certainly the data would show is something called acceptance and commitment therapy. But I think before we get to that point, I do think that we have to address that we are really facing a crisis of empathy in medicine. In medicine, 
the two things that we seem to prioritize are things that are really, really fast, like prescriptions, or things that really pay a lot of money, like procedures. And yet all this time, this empathy can take a lot of toll. And one of the things that's unique about our country is that the people who end up going in pain medicine on average have lower empathy than almost any other field. So this was a survey that was done that showed that anesthesiologists had the lowest scores of empathy in, in, in all of medical specialties. And I do think that this is something that we can work on, but one of the reasons that I actually strongly believe that this is the case is because how few women actually are in pain medicine. So this was from a perspective that was written by two uh, women pain physicians who showed that of the 48% of medical students, only 35% 30, became anesthesiologists. And of those, only 18% of them ended up becoming pain physicians. And in fact, I was surprised to hear that pain medicine was a specialty women were least likely to go into after their anesthesiology residency, suggesting that maybe perhaps there's more we can do to make pain medicine a more inclusive field for women, because we do know from studies that women tend to be on average more empathetic than men, and that most patients with chronic pain are actually women who respond better to a female physician. One of the things that I've incorporated in my life and one of the things that uh, that that has allowed uh, that, that the evidence suggests can help people live better is something called acceptance and commitment therapy. And basically what acceptance therapy does is that it changes people's focus from trying to control the pain at all points to, to being able to live your life despite the pain. And the questions in yellow, this is a questionnaire that's often used are things that, that show how, how much someone has accepted pain, that it's okay to experience pain, but that people should not sacrifice what they do or what they, so go to that birthday even if you hurt, because if you don't, that that's gonna make the pain even more worse. And that controlling pain at all costs is just not tenable. And to put that into practice, I wanted to share one last passage uh, from the book. Of the many peculiarities in the practice of medicine, one that is particularly peculiar is that doctors and nurses are highly unlikely to have lived with serious illness. Physicians mostly prescribe drugs, order imaging studies, and perform procedures they have never experienced themselves. They are like chefs who have never tasted their own food. That changed recently when my patient and I both got the same viral infection, shingles. As my rash faded and I began feeling better, my patient's trial was only beginning. Shingles can sometimes lead to a condition called post-herpetic neuralgia, where patients can have pain long after the shingles dissipates. Yet what he was experiencing was beyond anything I had ever seen compared to other patients. Innumerable medicines and nerve blocks to quell the torment had failed to give him back a shred of his previous pain-free existence. His pain by now had transfigured into something wholly different from what it was birthed as. Robbed of his dreams, he was so depressed he had essentially stopped eating. He showed me a picture of himself playing golf before shingles and he looked unrecognizable. His agony was so consumptive, so ravenous, it had left him emaciated, sapped of all his strength. At this point, we had already exhausted every conceivable medical intervention. There was nothing more we could honestly say or do to offer him relief, we thought. We didn't even know where his affliction lay. Was he in pain or was he suffering? In my native language, Urdu, the word for journey, suffer, is a homonym of the word of the English word for suffer, and has always seemed particularly beyond coincidence. Armed with a strong belief in acceptance, I sat on the bed next to him. He had already undergone a million dollar workup and received countless drugs and procedures. Though I was skeptical we would find some new cause for his pain or uncover treatment that would rid him of his agony, I reassured him that we as a team were fully committed to figuring out why he hurt so much and what we could do to help. At the same time, though, I confessed that the likelihood that we could make the pain go away was low. I want to help you live with this pain, I told him. I want you back to playing golf. Perhaps because he believed that we were all in, that we would do whatever it might take to help him, his entire outlook changed. Without making any changes to his drugs, within a few days, he began to feel much better. He refused to go to a rehab facility, motivated to get stronger on his own at home. Before he left, I asked if he was interested in seeing a pain psychologist. We were not raising the white flag, I told him. 
but gathering all the options we had at our disposal to close the rift that had opened up in his body. He eagerly accepted the referral. Pain acceptance has only recently become part of the biomedical approach to helping people live with pain, but even a cursory review reveals that it has been one of the primary ways we have lived with pain throughout our history. Buddhists often subdue intolerable pain by confronting it fully, not with boisterous bravado, but with quiet reflection or meditation. Most cultures have encouraged cohabitation with pain, emphasizing peaceful coexistence rather than armed confrontation. The most cutting edge pain science is not just revealing new things about pain, but reintroducing a way to inhabit our body that a burgeoning corporate machine selling visions of immortality and mass anesthesia failed to do. The most important things doctors and nurses and physical therapists can do is center their practice in empathy and kindness. But to allow kindness to become the standard of care, our medical schools and training programs have to make it a point of emphasis and our health system has to evolve. We need to take a multidisciplinary approach to pain that provides patients with all the tools we have to diminish how much they hurt. We need to make patient-centered care a reality rather than a buzzword by shifting the way providers are paid to reflect how patients do rather than what the system does to them. The reward for designing a healthcare system that provides care and love to all might resonate beyond the walls of hospitals and clinics. It will be the keystone for more just and equitable society. Thank you all for um, making time to hear me out um, and a uh, real privilege, privilege and honor. And uh, I wish I could have been there, but let's, uh, I'd love to take some questions. Perfect. Uh, well, thank you very much, Hader. On, on behalf of uh, Stanford University, the Department of Medicine, I'm just, uh, I just want to be the first to say thank you for a really powerful Grand Rounds. I think it gave, gives us a lot to think about. And uh, both of us as heart failure transplant cardiologists, um, we should emphasize that pain management is everyone's uh, role, uh, not just the primary care doctor or the pain management uh, specialist. Um, I certainly would encourage people to send questions in the Q&A, and I, we have some already. I have a, a couple of quick questions. The first one is, as you know, post-transplant, especially for those patients who've had ventricular assist devices and um, open wounds, uh, oftentimes they come in without having uh, a chronic pain um, system. And then by the time they're discharged after a lengthy hospitalization, they're now addicted to opioids. Uh, what can we do to, uh, to mi help mitigate some of that? Because we do see this, as you saw, these racial and gender differences in who gets uh, high dose opioids. How can, what can we do to kind of address that? I I, I think it's clear that opioids are not a silver bullet for pain, but certainly they have a role to play in pain management. Certainly in acute pain management, I think they will remain our mainstay. Uh, but I think opioids in isolation will just never be effective. And that's really what we've done. One of the most effective models for reducing opioid rates has actually been the VA. The VA provides access to interdisciplinary pain care to all its veterans in a way that much of the other health system doesn't. If you look at the entire US, we have only about 74 uh, interdisciplinary pain rehab programs in the entire country. Uh, the VA has most of them. And so I think one of the things that we need to do is really to be able to get people off of opioids. You can't do it in isolation. You can't do it without talking to the patient. And you have to set expectations early on with patients to tell them that what are the risks of chronic opioid use. And then if you do come up with a plan, do it in con conversation with the patient and open up other options, things like exercise things like therapy, things like non-opioids, all should be part of the mix. But I think what patients respond to more is love and care and, and, and just feeling heard. Um, and I think that we in transplant medicine often have the resources to do that uh, because we have these great teams um, that are well-funded, but I think many others will struggle. Uh, but I think it has to be, I think opioids are, are certainly a part of the milieu, uh, but they have to be wrapped around uh, a, an entire program rather than just be given or taken away in isolation. Perfect, excellent. And then there's a question by Dr. Charles Wong. Uh, the 1990s pain docs were teaching us that pain was the fifth vital sign and pointed to solid evidence about like such as neural remodeling, stress hormones, inflammatory markers. Uh, what are the guiding metrics we should use to avoid swinging too far off the other end uh, to the point that we're not treating pain? 
I think that's a fantastic question, and I think that that's really where we are at right now. What we know that what we know is that we don't want to do what we did before. You know, when we when we've had opioid epidemics in the past, we we swung in the wrong direction. We started a war on drugs. We completely eliminated opioids from our use, even at the end of life. Um, and we really created a crisis. Uh, I certainly don't want to see that happening. But I think the main thing that we can do is actually at the start. I think the I think the more um, careful we can be about starting opioids, what dose we use, how long we give people opioids. I think the more I think the better uh, it will be because once you're on chronic opioids, your body just changes in a way that it's just really hard for it to reset back to how it was before it was exposed to sorry uh, to opioids. And I think that's a real decision. I think spending time with patients, shared decision making, sharing the risks, I think those are things that are really, really important and are more important today than they've ever been before. Perfect. Uh, Thank the whole fifth vital sign uh, movement has been discredited. Uh, in fact, hospitals that used those metrics actually had more pain and more adverse events in hospitals that didn't use those metrics. So I think that that's, that's going to be part of the process is thinking about how can we better measure and assess pain. Um, because certainly the tools that we have right now are fairly crude. Perfect. Thank you. If it's okay with you, if we can go over by another five minutes, I'll just, uh, there are a couple of questions that I'll yes. try to ask, ask them quickly and then have some quick answers. Um, so the, the first one is, um, you know, can you share how, how to address the emotional overlap of pain with patients who are dealing with depression and anxiety? A lot of times when they're depressed, they basically ask for pain meds. How do you handle that? Uh, opioids are some of the most potent uh, forms of providing emotional relief and connectedness that we have. Uh, in fact, uh, the feeling that, that a mother has by holding their child is all driven by endogenous opioids that our body creates. Uh, and which is why so much of the crisis around opioids that we're seeing is not just a medical crisis. It is a, it is a crisis of loneliness. It is, a, it is a crisis of a mental health problem that we've just left fester. We've created so much stigma associated with receiving mental health care that people are not just, just not getting the help that they need. So I think the first thing that we need to do is really remove the stigma around mental health and the overlap with pain. I think patients are never going to do that because if they ta start talking about how their depression or stress affects their pain, they know that doctors are just going to say, oh, this is just in your head. This is, we just we don't need to treat it. You're not having physical pain. And so it has to come from our side that we have to make it OK for patients to say that their pain is related to how they feel. And then go and, and then once we've developed that understanding and that relationship, then start thinking about what are the resources that we can provide patients. I mean, I started doing that in my practice. I thought that patients would be very opposed to being heard that, oh, do you want to see a pain psychologist? Because I thought that patients would be like, oh, is this doctor saying it's all in my head? But I think that if you explain it properly, if you share that this is just about figuring out how best you can live with pain, how best you can optimize yourself, just like you would with any other type of chronic disease, I think people become more open-minded. So I do think that those two things are extremely interconnected and that we as physicians should lead the charge in reducing the stigma associated with receiving appropriate mental health care in patients with chronic pain. Perfect. And then uh, wrapping up, uh, David Spiegel's uh, question was really, uh, you know, since there's widespread belief that placebo hypnosis and ACT improves pain, that some people will say that pain is not real, but this creates a disincentive for patients who may feel belittled because they're so acclimated to getting pain meds, to opioids, so how can we enhance the use and the respect and acceptance from patients of these non-pharmacologic approaches to pain management? I, I think people have, you know, I think people who are already on opioids have a really, you know, many of them have a very strong relationship with opioids. I, you know, I, even as someone who says that opioids have a role to play in chronic pain, despite the evidence not supporting it, uh, I still get pushback. I still, I think there's still people who feel that patients with chronic pain or who are taking opioids are being demonized. Um, and yet I don't think that that's the case. I think that, I think what we've done is that we've opened up this rift um, I, but, uh, between patients and physicians because of the opioid epidemic. But I think that what I have seen, again, I don't always succeed, but I think if you spend time, if I spend time with patients, if I build a relationship with them first, that's really the important thing. If I can get them to trust me and, and know that I can, that I have their best interest in mind, they're much more likely to think about what I have to say afterwards. 
if that's the first thing I say to a patient, they're going to completely shut me off. This, I, I feel like it works. And this is what I've experienced with other things like vaccine hesitancy, et cetera, where unless you have a relationship, you're just not going to be able to change minds and hearts. And, and, and if it just, and, 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 and which is why I think part of the joy of working at the VA is that we do have the gift of time. We do have the gift of being able to spend more time with patients that I think does help. And I think that there's a lot of lessons that the rest of our healthcare system has to learn from the VA. But thank you, David, and thank you so much for all the work you've done in, in really um, opening up this field in ways that few have. And thank, thank you very much. And I have to say that uh, this has been great and we have so many questions, we just can't get to all of them, but, uh, but um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Harrington. Great. Oh, thank you, Eldrin, and thank you, Hader. And you can tell by the questions that people are uh, both intrigued and appreciative of uh, of what you did with this book. And we look forward to uh, to all reading it. And we also look forward to hearing more as to how the uh, how we as professional healthcare professionals can do a better job in helping all of our patients uh, manage uh, pain, which is obviously, as you pointed out, an important part of what we can do as uh, as clinicians. So thank you for visiting us virtually. I hope we can uh, get you out here to campus sometime in the future. And uh, thanks, Eldrin, for, um, for hosting this week's Medical Grand Rounds. We'll see everybody next week. Bye-bye.